love Isaac and go to the region of Moriah, sacrificing there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. <coughs> On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. But Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba. <coughs> and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. And God will bless his word today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Trish, for the word, reading the word. Thank you, worship team. Always want to acknowledge the worship team that has been leading us in worship was indeed a blessing. God bless you. Thank you all for coming. I'm not going to forget that we are precious uh, in the sight of God and we appreciate you. God bless you. Do we have any visitors? People are coming for the first time here. We have never been here before and we are here for the very first time. Anybody? No? Right, okay. God bless you. We thank God. Right, we have just uh, been reading from that passage, but before we do that, it's Father's Day today. Yeah. Yeah. Happy Father's Day! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure after this we'll take time to appreciate fathers a bit more. <laughs> uh, in some way, everybody uh, everybody here is connected to a father or a dad somewhere. For you to be here, you are fathered. Right? And some, some are dads, some are not dads, but you are connected to fathers. 
So that's why it's going to be relevant to everybody, what we are going to be talking about. You just look a little bit into the history, because I like to do that. We don't want to just uh, talk about things or get into things. There is nothing in the Bible about Father's Day. I want, I want, I want you to be clear about that. There is nothing in the Bible about Father's Day. There's nothing in the Bible about Mother's Day. But we take opportunities like this to teach people or talk about the importance of fathers on such a day. How did it originate? Uh, in some pagan societies, they were already celebrating Father's Day, but they were calling the father of the sky. Uh, who provide the rain, and they were using that to commemorate uh, fatherhood. And uh, there was a story which is more popular that people talk about in terms of the origin of this Father's Day that we now celebrate, not just in this country, but in the world over. It started in America uh, some many, many, many years ago. Uh, there was a woman and this woman was called Sonora Louise Smart uh, in Washington. She was listening to a sermon about Father's Day, but for her, her mother had died in childbirth while giving birth to her sixth sibling or her sixth uh, child. So Sonora's sibling. Uh, so the mother died in childbirth and the dad raised the six children as a single father. So it became a burden for her to say they are recognizing mothers, but they are not really recognizing, nobody is really recognizing and appreciating what fathers are doing. This is what my dad did for us. As a single dad, he raised us. Uh, she then approached, took it a step further and approached a different churches, different clergymen, a different um, priests, people who were in position of authority in churches. Uh, and uh, on 19th of June, uh, 1910, uh, I think most of us were born by then, 1910, uh, that was the first unofficial Father's Day that was celebrated. And then six years later, uh, President Richard Nixon signed it into law that is now called Father's Day. So it has spread far and wide throughout the world and people are now celebrating what is called Father's Day. And there are many, many, many things like we've just seen a sign. Thank you, Brother Kenny. We've just seen a demonstration of fatherhood here, uh, he, he, which, which is quite touching. Unfortunately, uh, in societies, not just in African cultures, but even here, uh, when children were being raised, people, the children were there to be seen and not heard. So as a result, the relationship between father and son or father and children was unspoken. That would turn up, you provide the food, you provide all the resources needed, you work really hard and achieve a lot, but not really much was spoken about what he was doing to his children or also the children to him. Where I grew up, I, my, my dad had uh, four, like four, he had children by four women. So there's eight of us, half siblings and so on. So when, when, when he died, he left a few properties. And uh, these properties, some we discovered later on after he died. Um, he was working really hard. He was not really living in luxury, but he was doing this for his children. But that was unspoken. So that communication was not really 
there. Dad was there. We knew Dad was there. I was telling my wife, I said, I still remember, I only remember two statements from my father. Two statements that still stick with me now because it was a bit strange, but <laughs> just two statements. My whole life. He died when I was in, uh, in my late 40s. You no, know, early 40s. When I was in my early 40s, <laughs> <laughs> I know some of you are trying to measure us for so <laughs> <laughs> In my early 40s, he died. Uh, <clears throat> so, I was exactly 40 actually. Right, don't think of my Right, so he died. And, and when he died, that time, you can imagine all those years, 40 years, I remember two statements from him. I'm not saying he never spoke to me. I'm not saying he never spoke to my siblings, but two important statements that I still remember. So which means the relationship was not as close as it should be. It's, it doesn't reflect somebody who is spending everyday time talking to his son or talking to his child. And unfortunately, these things have kind of perpetuated into our generation. That, uh, you know, you know I love you. There's no need for me to say I love you, son. You know it. It's a given. Right? So it's not spoken. I think you know I work with children and families all the time, and we are constantly doing parenting assessments and everything. And we see this every day. Observe the relationship between dad and child, and they are seeing dad. He's not saying anything to the child. Uh, I'm not really talking about new moms, but it's the same thing, really, that we see as a pattern. So it is a result of things that, wrong cultures that have been perpetuated because the dad has learned from his dad, his dad learned from his dad, his dad learned from his dad, and there were no true role models. So what we are looking at today, we will be talking about true role models of fatherhood. Mm. Of course, we know the God of the fatherless, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is above all. But when we talk about earthly fathers, what the world is lacking today are true role models. For somebody becomes a dad, I can take Francis here, uh, he's a young man. Uh, and uh, by the time he becomes a dad, if he is not learning from true role models, he will just continue what he saw other fathers do. Because he will not just know naturally what fatherhood is all about, unless he's inspired of God. Now, we have different types of fathers, as we know. You know, thank you, Angela. Angela was getting into the prayer, and I was saying, oh, you are getting in, into my message as you are praying. Thank God. God bless you. <laughs> there are some biological fathers, but these biological fathers are fathers who actually uh, deposited the seed and the, a child is born. Some, they just deposit the seed and disappear. They are biological. We do that again. It's something that I do in my job. Try to look, they say, where is the dad? We want the putative father. Where is he? And we go everywhere, go through systems to try to find him and not find them. And sometimes you find them and they don't want to know. They are biological dads, but really never contribute anything to the child. And then there are some biological parents, of course, who are responsible, who are disp responsible for nurturing the child. You must know father's responsibilities to nature the child. They are accountable. They've got responsibilities to provide. They have responsibilities to meet the child's needs. They've got responsibility to advise and support in times of crisis, times of need. They are, they've got responsibility to offer affection. I quite enjoyed, you know, doing some, you know, bed, uh, bedtime stories and uh, you know, I quite enjoyed that. 
it's one part of being a dad. But in most households, it's the mom who's doing that all the time. So the dad is not available. Or maybe genuinely unavailable, busy working. But while we are doing that, we are missing out on this precious time, precious moment of bonding with the child. So as they grow older, you are drifted apart. That's why you see a lot of children gravitating toward the mom. Uh, when parents separate, you see children gravitating toward the mom. Because this relationship was never built uh, or established, properly developed in the first place. Then we've got some adoptive fathers who really become fathers indeed. But they all go through pain sometimes, the pain of being called, you are not my dad. Especially when the child grows up and they are a teenager, they become rebellious, they start throwing tantrums, and they say, you are not my dad. We've got some stepdads as well, who come in and they are really doing some very important roles in supporting uh, the child and everything. And they also get it, you are not my dad. And then we have got some uh, father figures in the society, in the community. Like uh, Brother Ken was saying, we say in Africa it takes a whole community to raise a child. Not just one person. Because the reason why I think this side of the world we have got a lot of crisis with young people, because the responsibility of raising a child is just left to that parent alone. So if there's no communal support, if that parent was not brought up properly and they don't have the values to raise the child, then that child will just become rebellious and become lost in the community. But what we have in Africa, we have got some uh, children, I'm not saying it's still there everywhere in every community, originally, it used to be there here, because I speak to some uh, older uh, people about what things used to look like here. It used to be there where the whole community would help out in looking after a child, supporting that child, nurturing them, which was very important. Now we've got some further figures in the society or in the community who take responsibility to offer advice, guidance to children, support to children, even if they are not related to them, they are not biologically theirs, they are not related in any shape or form, but they are there in the community, offering advice. We've got some people who work in the shops. Kids go to the shop and they like hearing stories from these people. They like being given advice. There are some people who work like we in the police force. Some people who are like fathers indeed uh, in the community. Then in the church now, which we'll be looking at, when this, all these kids that we have got downstairs, I think, I don't know if, if you check that half the church is downstairs now, <coughs> right? So we've got loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of kids downstairs. They, those kids are coming here, or their parents bring them here to church to find a family. They are coming here to find a community. I was giving an example of Francis, if you don't mind, sorry, I keep repeating your name. Uh, he's a young, young person who is here in the church. When he starts raising a family, he may not have blood relations around him to support him or to support them with that. They may not have that, but when they are here, they've got a family. So it's our responsibility to, together, collectively, to support them, help them, nature, nature them, guide them, uh, give them the direction to go. So that's what the church is about. Then there are some dads who are absent. Like I was saying, my dad was absent. I would see him once a month, and only for a few hours, maybe sometimes properly, uh, and it was like that. Absent. They're there, they're paying the school fees, they're, they're sending money for food and everything, but they're absent from direct relationship. There are some people who may have gone through that, who still have the scars and the wounds of the neglect of fathers, who are still struggling emotionally and mentally because of the fathers did not do 
We cannot reverse the time. But we have got a father who is the father of the fatherless. You've got a father who is caring. You've got a father who loves you unconditionally. Regardless of what you went through, regardless of what you feel or how you feel about your, pe your dad. You might feel wounded. You might still feel like you can't forgive them. There are some people who have suffered abuse at the hands of dad. I work with that daily. Suffering abuse, proper, horrific abuse from their dad. Biological stepdad and people who are supposed to be father figures, teachers in the community. And these kids have suffered abuse. But now, what are, what are we saying here? God talks about forgiveness. He talks about healing and restoration. This is what the church is about. Jesus healing you from all that trauma, that suffering you may have gone through. And there are some dads who have become dads and they've been damaged themselves, broken. They've been abused themselves. So they don't know any different. They just carry on. They perpetuate that cycle of abuse because that's all they know. So we're saying as a church, we've got a responsibility. That's why the Bible says you are the salt of the earth. We are here to season the community, to season the environment, to show the world what it is about to be true fathers. God is looking for positive role models. The world is desperately looking for fathers who are going to model what true fatherhood is about. Guided by the Holy Spirit, guided by the word of God. And here we just read a story of uh, Father Abraham, who used to sing about it. He had many sons. <laughs> I wish I could sing. <laughs> Right, it's like that Father Abraham had many sons, and uh, he is called the father of nations, he is called the father of faith, and we just read that portion of scripture, and we are going to be looking at that deeply into that scripture. So Abraham was credited uh, as righteous when he believed in God, according to the scriptures. He was not justified by faith, but by righteousness. And we hear what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. God is looking for righteous fathers. He's looking for fathers who walk in the fear of God, in righteousness. He's looking for fathers who are going to leave a legacy, like Jillian was saying last week, a legacy of righteousness for generations to come. Fathers who are going to, even if you can't leave material things, that's why the Bible says that a good father will leave an inheritance. He will leave a heritage for his children and their children's children. It has to be a heritage of faith. Sadly, in the world and in the church today, we have many fathers who are very laid back. It is my prayer today, fathers. It is my prayer today, dads, that we need to wake up from our slumber. The roles in the family, they've been reversed. The mothers are doing the roles of fathers while the fathers are busy slumbering. The roles in the community have been reversed because the fathers are not really performing their duties as called by God. God has designed it that fathers in the community should be showing and modeling to the world that they are present and they know and they fear God, which is a problem that we have. In Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 22, I'll just read this quickly. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. 
Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. So in other words, Abraham against all hope, he believed, hoped in God. Even physically, when it looked like it was impossible for him to have a child, he continued to believe in God. Even if his wife was as good as that, at 90 years old, it was impossible for somebody to give birth to a child. But he continued to believe in God. He continued to trust in God. What are the dreams that God has spoken to you about? What are the things that you have been promised? What are the things that God has shown you? And you are thinking, oh, it's not going to happen anymore. But Abraham knew that he could not give up because God had spoken. And he knew one thing, that God could not lie. He knew that God is not man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should repent of his word. Once he is spoken, he will surely make sure it comes to pass. That's the difference between God and us. You can promise your child, you can promise your son, your daughter something. You have been promised things and they never came to pass. And some are still bitter right now against their dad to say, he promised me this, but he never did it. Is that true, Sana? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> he promised me this, but he never did it. Because in the natural, sometimes we will not fulfill promises because of certain reasons. I might, I might not get the resources, circumstances might change, and then I can't fulfill that promise. But as God, our Father, he will not relent, he will not fail on his promises. If he has promised you something, it will surely come to pass. That's what the Bible says again when you read to in Isaiah chapter 55. You know, it tells you that his word will not return to him void, but it will accomplish whatever purpose he sends it to accomplish. That's God. He cannot lie. He will never lie. He cannot fail. Trish, I think Trish agrees with me from your testimony. What he has promised, he will fulfill. This is your God who reigns forevermore who can never fail. So we keep trusting in him. So now, in this context where we are reading, the Bible says it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Everybody, I will say, every man of faith will be tested in one form or another. According to Jewish, the Jewish beliefs, they say in this chapter alone, Abraham was tested ten times. Why are they saying ten times? It was heavier what God was asking Abraham to do. It was heavy. Remember, it took him years to see the son of the promise. It took him years. He was 75 years old when God says, you shall be father of nations. And it took him 25 years of waiting for the son of the promise. And when Isaac comes, he's 100 years old, and you know, now God is saying, take, let's listen to God. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. So that's number one. Take your son, your only son, whom you love and go and sacrifice him at the place, the mountain, I'm going to show you. So he's heading toward Moriah. Those words alone were very heavy to take. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. What is it that's so precious to you, that you value so much, and God is saying, give that up? How would you feel? Give that up. But God cannot lie, remember. And Abraham knew that. Remember, Sarah this time was still alive. She only died in chapter 23 of Genesis after this. 
So you can imagine Abraham going to Sarah and saying, oh, what? <laughs> I don't know how you would say that. <laughs> he said to take our son and take him to Moriah. And he said to, to do what? To sacrifice. Uh, you, you, you wouldn't be able to utter that. <laughs> so you can say you must be joking. <laughs> yeah. Imagine she's waited all these years for a child. And then she's got one child, only child. And now you are saying to go and sacrifice him. Remember when God was speaking, she even laughed. She said, is it possible? Is it going to be possible for me to bear a son when I'm old like this? And then you remember the word that she was told. All things are possible with God. He is the God of all flesh. There is nothing too difficult for him. Now the sun has come. Remember Isaac at this time was between 25 and 35 years old. He was not a small boy. He was between 25 and 35 years old. Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, says 25. So we can just say maybe 25 and 40 in between. He was there, so he was grown up but we know he was not yet married at this time. And now he's saying, take him and go and sacrifice him there. It took obedience. Number one, I want you to see the things that we are seeing in the father of faith here. He took hearing from God, recognizing the voice of God, which is essential for everybody. It's hearing. There are so many voices that speak. And you've got to recognize the voice of God. After you recognize the voice of God is to obey. The Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. Is to obey. So Abraham had to obey. I, I think he just said, oh, we are going to worship maybe Sarah. I don't know why to say to Sarah. The Lord kept that a secret from us. He might say, oh, we are just going to worship. So he took two young lads with him, two of his servants, and he took Isaac and he cut the wood. Remember, this man is about 130 years old. And he is cutting the wood. He could have asked his servant to do it, but he does it himself, physically. And we were saying this work is too precious because it's God who has instructed. I'm not going to instruct somebody else to do it. I'm going to do it myself. And he splits the wood and they carried it all the way. They could have gone and prepared the wood there and around the region of Moriah, which was something like 45 miles away. They could have gone to, to look for the wood there, but prepared the wood, bundled the wood, and put the, the wood on uh, Isaac's shoulders. Now, I want you to see. In theology, they've got a term that they call typology. Right? Typology is it's from type. So Isaac is a type of Christ. He's pictured in the Bible as a type of Jesus. So in other words, you remember what, what we were talking about? We were talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament and the Old Testament revealed. So in other words, there are things that were yet to come, a thousand, thousands of years to come, that were being said prophetically, but that are not yet revealed. So this is what is happening. He put the bundle on Isaac. That symbolizes the cross that Jesus was carrying. Remember, he says also, take your only son. <laughs> and uh, Abraham does not have one son at this moment. We know 14 years before Isaac was born, there was Ishmael. But we know in chapter 21 that Abraham then sent Ishmael and his mom Hagar packing, right? And uh, God is recognizing Isaac and saying, your only son. Because Isaac is the son of the promise. So he said, take your only son. Like you see in John chapter 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his what? Only son. So the same thing with Abraham, 
If that's his only son, take him whom you love. Remember, the word love there is what is also called the law of first mention. There are some words that are said for the first time. What is God saying when it's mentioned for the first time? Pay attention. So the word love here in relation to God and man is mentioned for the first time here in the Bible, in Genesis 22. Your only son whom you love. Your only son whom you love. Take him and go and sacrifice. God is emphasizing to him, your son whom you love, dear. So you can see the burden that Abraham was carrying as he was walking. And it was three days journey. <laughs> three days journey, you can see the picture of Christ. Died in the grave for three days and rose on the third day. Now we are seeing symbolically that Isaac is dead in Abraham's head and mind and spirit while he's walking that three day journey. He's symbolically dead. He's not there. Because you can't picture him, you can't see him. So he's carrying this burden and he's going. Slowly he's going. And he settled his doggy. And Abraham was very rich. He could have asked one of his servants to do it. But again, he had to do it himself. And he's going. I don't think there was much talking on the way. And they're going. They're going. As they are about to reach the place, the Bible says, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw what the place afar off. He could see the place that was the Mount uh, Moriah. And there, the, the, the area, the region was called the region of Moriah. And uh, they say, some theologians, that that place where he went to sacrifice was the places, same as Mount Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. So he sees the place of foul. What does he say to his servant? Stay here. Why in the, in the land go yonder to worship? The word worship is again law of first mention. Mentioned for the first time again in the Bible. He says, I and the Lord are going to commune with God. We are going to fellowship with God. Sacrifice was part of the worship. So you stay here. The business we are about to do now, you are not part of it. You remain behind. And I can say to you this morning that there are some times when you want to go deeper in fellowship and communion with God that you don't need the crowd around you. There are times that fathers that you don't need sometimes your wife and children around you when you want to engage God deeper in prayer and fellowship, in communion. You wake up early in the morning and you are there, you are groaning in the spirit, you are fellowshipping, you are communing with God. And he says, you stay here while I go yonder to pray, to worship. And they are on the way, walking. Isaac is carrying the wood. He's carrying, almost like going through a Gethsemane where there's groaning where Jesus is saying, Father, if it were possible, let this cup pass away. But now, let it not be my will, but your will. So Abraham is going through this groaning, is going through this pain of losing his son, his only son. <clears throat> but because of the father of faith he is, he continues to believe that even if he dies, God is going to raise him from the dead. That, that's like Jesus rose from the dead. But remember, Jesus said it had not yet been revealed, but God, by revelation, showed it to Abraham. In the community or the area that they were living, their surrounding regions, the pagans, they used to believe in human sacrifice. Abraham might have asked himself, oh, so my God is asking me to sacrifice a human. I thought you were different from this pagan God. And he is going. He is going on his way. Remember, it's high up. They are climbing up. God all this while is giving him an opportunity. That, remember, it's a test. To see how strong his faith is. Abraham 
is not so much trusting in the promise of God, but he's trusting and believing in the promise of the promise. <coughs> the problem that we have sometimes, we believe so much in things that have been said or God has said, and we lose our focus and trust in the promiser. God is the one who gives you that promise, and he cannot fail. And it is impossible for him to fail. He's got all the power, he's got all the authority, he's got all the ability, he's got all the resources to meet your need. Even if things like look like they are crumbling down. You might be in business and the business looks like it's going down. It looks dead. You believe in the one who promised you, who cannot fail. You believe in the one who raises the dead. You believe in the one you know, who can create something out of nothing. So you trust in him. You hold on to him without giving up. Remember, Abraham could have said on the second day, mm, no, let's go back. If it was today, uh, Grandma Sarah could have made a phone call. How are you? <laughs> Just that phone call to say, how are you? How is my son doing? <laughs> and he knows where he's going. He knows that we have to sacrifice him. And he receives that phone call. That would be enough to discourage him. But he's going on his journey. It's a journey of solitude. Sometimes if you are going to a place of sacrifice, it is a journey of solitude. It's a lonely journey. It's a journey sometimes where you feel abandoned, you feel lost, you feel discouraged, you feel every negative feeling. And the devil, remember, whispers as well to try and discourage you. So those three days was a test enough to show how solid he was in his faith in God. It also shows, demonstrates God's trust in Abraham. Remember what, the, what, what God said to, to, to the devil in Job uh, when, when, when Satan also appeared? Then the angels of God had appeared before God, and Satan appeared also. And God said to him, oh, where, where are you coming from? He said, oh, from down the earth, you know, just roaming about. He said, have you considered my servant Job? Seeing that he doesn't waver in his faith, he walks righteously before me. What is God saying? Will he trust you such a test? Will he entrust you with that, that you are going to overcome? Remember, a test is different from a temptation. A temptation is designed to lead you to fail. Whereas a test is designed to lead you to succeed. A temptation is designed to pull you down, to destroy you. A test is designed to strengthen your faith and your trust in God, your confidence in God. So now, they are walking up the mountain. As they are walking, Isaac said, Daddy, I, maybe he's not saying daddy anymore. He's saying father because he's grown up. He, he's saying, Father, I can see you have got the, we have got the wood. I can see we have got the fire. But where is the land for the burnt offering? And I like what he said. He said, The Lord Himself will provide the land for the burnt offering. Abraham is speaking by the power and unction of the Holy Spirit prophetically that God is going to show up as Jehovah Jireh. God is going to show up as Jehovah the provider. And at the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. When you are in a situation, difficult situation, negativity surrounding you, people questioning you, this is the time to declare the true word of the living God. So Abraham is speaking prophetically. The Lord himself is going to provide the labor for the burnt offering. Now, coming back to the relationship that we're talking about, obviously Abraham is a relationship with Isaac. He had that relationship that Isaac knew if dad is saying this, it shall indeed happen. Isaac knew if dad is saying, let's go, I can't question that. 
You've got kids these days, you, you, you parents or dads are saying, oh, let's do this. Why? <laughs> Why do you want me to do that? No, I have my plans with my mate. <laughs> I've got something else to do and everything. Now, it's coming back to the grassroots to say, how are we raising these kids? Are we shocking them in the word and in the presence of the living God? Are we raising them to believe and trust in God more than they can trust in anything else? I know we are living in a world that's so full of peer pressure, peer influence, that's so full of negative information, the internet. It's a big thing, isn't it? Where technology has become a big thing, taken over the instruction of the parents. And we want to claim this back to say we want our children back, just like the Bible says in Malachi 4, 6, that he shall, he will return the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. We want to claim back and say, God, we want that to be restored. We pray for the restoration of the true bride of Jesus Christ, the restoration of the true relationship of father son, father, daughter, relationship. We pray that the roles of fathers be restored, that you be restored to where you should be. In the majority of families, when there are single moms, you can see the struggles. Sometimes when we are counseling and speaking to, to young people, even in workplaces and everything, we are talking, we normally do what we call a family history where we look at uh, what's it like what is it a broken family where is the dad and the first question is where is that if that is missing in the picture majority of the kids that we work with they you know they're disoriented there's no direction because that is not there sometimes when you find that the moment you find that you start to see them being restored now where are we, the fathers who are here? What's our role? What are we doing? What impact are we having in our families, in the community? Because remember, you are the priest of your home. We see some people writing on the wall, God is the priest of this house. No, it's not God, it's you who is the priest of your home. God is above you, but you are the priest of that home. You are the one who is there to guide you are the one who is there to offer protection, guidance, security. You are the one who is, who is there to support with confidence, building, show them, tell them about life. I remember my son Josh saying to me uh, someday, I was talking about something. He said, no, Dad, you didn't like that. I'm still 17. He said, no, 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 I'm not going to wait until you're 40 to, to tell you about these things. I may not be here when you're 40, but I start giving you instruction, guidance now. Even for things that we are going to need 20 years, 40 years from now. Let's not be lackadaisical when it comes to this. Let's, let's not be laid back. Let's not neglect our responsibility. Because when we do that, it's to the demise of our children. It's to the demise of the next generation. Because we are not doing what we should be doing. God has instructed you as a steward of your home. As instructed fathers, as stewards in the home. That's where things start. That's why, you know, before you even think about, oh, I, I want to lead a community, I want to, 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 to lead in the church, I want to do this. This is your first church in the home. That's your first church. That's why when it comes to qualifications of uh, elders and deacons, it talks about them being able to govern their own families. Because that's where the responsibility starts. And that's God's expectation for us. That's God's expectation. Now, Father, I can see the wood, which symbolizes the cross. I can see the fire. But where is the lamp for the burnt offering? God himself will provide. And they, and they go high up. Abraham is preparing an altar to sacrifice. And Isaac is watching. 
He said, my dad, I know my dad said God is gonna provide the land. But he bundles him up <laughs> and puts him on the altar. But we don't hear Isaac complaining. I'm sure he's saying, oh, so when is that not saying? So am I the sacrifice now? He is on that altar. You can imagine the emotions that Abraham was going through. Imagine the emotions that Isaac was going through during that time. His bundle is on the altar and dad picks up this knife and he's like that. And the angel of God, he hears the voice of God in that moment and it says, Abraham, it's not enough, Abraham. When something is said twice, it's double emphasis to show the importance of it. I hear my friend from, 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 from West Africa, when they call you, how many times did I call you? <laughs> <laughs> it is double emphasis. So if I have called you once, yeah, you can be it. But if I call you twice, I call you the same time. And you are still quiet there. <laughs> you, are, you are in trouble. Serious trouble. <laughs> right. <laughs> so now, he calls him twice. And Abraham listened. And immediately, he knew, recognized the voice of God. A time that God is calling, God is calling. He's calling your name in the morning. He's calling your name in the night. He's calling your name in the afternoon and you're busy. Doing whatever you're doing. Busy typing. Busy sending messages, texting. And God is calling you. He's calling you many, many, many times. We need to be attuned to hearing the voice of God. We need to be attuned to hearing him when he speaks. And when he speaks, you've got to respond. I remember we used to sing, when he calls me, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. When he calls, sometimes he calls you in the night hours when you are very tired, exhausted, asleep, and people ignore it. But Abraham was very quick to hear. And he responded. And then we hear the voice of God saying, do not do anything to the land. And as he speak, the voice is speaking, the Bible says, Abraham lifts up. Sometimes the problem that we have, we are busy praying. People are going praying in the spirit. They are praying in the spirit. Oh, they are going shaka mandaribaka sanda. They are going in the spirit and they have no time to listen to the voice of God when he's speaking. We need to give ourselves time to listen to God. Abraham could have missed the voice of God and carried on in the sacrifice. There are many who missed. Why did, why did Moses miss the promised land? Such a great man of God. We had communion with God. We had fellowship with God. We had encounters with God on the mountain. And he would come down and his face was full of the anointing. And people could not countenance him because of the glory of God upon him. But he missed the promise. Why did he miss? He missed it. God said, speak to the rock. And he struck the rock twice. He missed because of that. Sounds like simple disobedience, but he missed out because of that. Now the Lord is saying to us, when he speaks, we've got to be ready to listen and take heed of his instruction. So he listens and he takes his heed. He says, do not, then he stopped immediately. Sometimes God is saying, do not, and we go on, we carry on, and we do it. And then we say, I'll confess later. <laughs> and people then confess after. But the damage is that they have missed out on that opportunity. And then the Bible says he then lifted up his eyes. That's why the Bible says, watch and pray. But not just praying and not watching. You are looking 
Thank you, Lord. You want to see if there's any movement in that direction. If there's an area, something you are praying for, check for the movement. Check for the move of God. <coughs> Elijah said, a servant, go and check the sky and see if there's anything that we can see. Uh, that sure that rain is coming. Mm -hmm. But he had to look and say, I can hear it. The sound of abundance of rain. I can hear the sound. I can hear the sound. I can see the abundance of rain before its manifestation. And then after that, the servant went and checked. Said, oh, I can see a cloud that looks like, like a man's hand. To him, that was enough confirmation. God was doing it. So sometimes we are praying for something and God starts moving. We don't see it because we are not watching. They saying watch and pray. So now we see Abraham. He sees a ram caught up by its horns in the thicket. He went, took it, and sacrificed it. When he sacrificed the ram instead of Isaac, we now hear what God says. He says, because you have done this, this is what, what God is saying. You have done this. You have not withheld your only son. In blessing, I will bless you. Mm. And multiplying, I will multiply you. Your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sun which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of the enemy. This is God who is now, see, who is now speaking. Your descendants are going to possess the gate of the enemies. It started by obedience. He is tested. He, obe he obeys God. It is credited to him for righteousness. And if you go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the Bible, the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please him. Look at verse 17 as well. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. This is what the, the word of God says. Chapter 11, verse 17. This is God who is speaking about, <coughs> about Abraham. This is what he did. He receives God in a, he receives back Isaac. Right, verse 17. I'll, I'll just read that out to you. <coughs> By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Right? So in other words, by faith, Abraham offered up Isaac as a sacrifice. But the promise had been made that through Isaac, I'm going to bless you. So you can see where the faith is. Through Isaac, I'm going to bless you. But he went on to offer him up because God had spoken. And he, by figuratively, like I was saying, received him back from the dead on the third day. That's when Isaac is restored back, figuratively. Jesus rose up on the third day. On the third day, when all hope was lost, when everybody th th thought he has lost, when everybody thought uh, it is finished, he is risen from the dead. And the angel said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. So just like Isaac is restored back to life, we see this is what happened to Jesus. So I've got some few issues that challenge us today as we finish, as we pray today. I believe there are some uh, among us who may have some very hateful feelings toward their dads, the way they were raised, who may have bitterness, who may be struggling in the way, who may have many questions about the way they were raised and they feel very bitter.
They feel like my dad didn't do uh, what they were supposed to do, and they can't forgive them. Some are not speaking to their dad now, as we speak, and the dad are there. Some are not speaking to them. And there's some dads who are here who have got this bitterness as well. Because they're not speaking to their children, the children are not speaking back to them. But the Bible is saying he, he is God of restoration. He restores the children back to the fathers. The fathers to the children. He is God of restoration. He wanted to establish you as a role model for this society, for this world, to model what fatherhood is all about. The love of God is all about. And God wants to train you and raise you up. Even if you are not a dad yet, or you are not even a dad, God wants to train you up to give you the heart of a father. A father longs to see life. A father longs to see uh, children growing up and developing and thriving in the society, in the community, overcoming, taking up the gates of the enemy, possessing the gates of the enemy, being victorious, receiving blessings, a father desires to see their children doing better than they ever did. I remember I used to be a school teacher and I've got many children that I taught who are now some who are doctors, some who are professors, some who are so and so in different positions. It is my joy. When they ring me up and they say, oh, we are doing this, we just bought our third, fourth property. We've just done this, uh, something that I've never achieved. It is my joy to say, wow, I didn't know that that time when I was talking to you as a 13, 14 year old, I didn't know that this is what I was investing. You find only a few that come back and say thank you. Some, they go, it's still my job. Wherever they go, even if they don't get back in contact, that's fine. Doing it in love, that's just like a dad. When they do well, you're not saying, oh, because you bought five properties, why don't you give me one? <laughs> right? It's a blessing for you to see that. That's a prayer today for the fathers. All the mothers who are here, pray for the fathers. I tell you sometimes the burden that fathers take alone. I don't know many, many, many fathers who are always talking all the time. Sometimes they keep quiet. They're carrying the burden and they're going. It's for you to identify that, mm, there must be something. Support them, encourage them. They need that encouragement sometimes. Is that, is that so, fathers? Yes. We need that encouragement sometimes. Some, somebody to encourage me. Somebody to tell me what I'm doing is right. Because maybe in work, I've gone through humiliation, suffering. In work, I'm being criticized. I'm being looked down upon. I've got other people, the bosses who are roaring at me. And I'm coming home to find comfort. And I find this woman nagging at me. <laughs> <coughs> and God help us. <laughs> <laughs> it's the love of God. The love of God that we are looking for. Coming back, every dad, I can say, every dad here who agree with me that they, it's their desire to see their family doing well, thriving. That's why they work hard, put in the hours, doing this. They want the family to prosper. But we want to pray today that God may help us, strengthen you. Even if you are feeling weak and tired, dad, we want to pray for you. Even if there's somebody who has been broken, I've said many things, we want to pray for you, that God helps you to be in that place where you should be, forgiving others. If your dad has hurt you, has neglected you, forgive them, let go. Even if they are no longer here with us, let go. Because all those are those that the enemy seizes. Because what, one thing that you want to know is sometimes your breakthrough is hindered. Because you are not forgiving, you are not letting go. Your prayers are not heard because of that. So it's time for you to come and say, God, I know it is a fact that my dad, my dad abused me. I know it is a fact that my dad did this to me. But I'm coming here now, I'm, for, I'm choosing to forgive them. I'm choosing to let go of them. I'm choosing right now, Lord, to forgive and let go. 
Because when you hold up that bitterness, it's going to eat you up. It's going to destroy you. And you, it's time to let go. I know you might have suffered a lot. I understand that. But it's time for you to come back and say, God, I don't want this door to be opened anymore. I don't want this accusation to come to me anymore. Because the devil will accuse you. Oh, look, we can't, we can't even forgive. You can't even let go. Look, we can't even do that. So do you think you get anything? Because the Bible is very clear about forgiveness. If you do not forgive other people in this world, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Simple, straightforward. No compromise, no discussion, period. Your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Shall we stand? We need to pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Shanda Rabaka Sanda. We bless your name. We bless your name this afternoon. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, mighty Father. Thank you for the work that you are doing in our lives, mighty God. Thank you for healing, oh God, all the emotional wounds, oh my God. Thank you for setting us completely free. And I pray, oh God, this afternoon that you minister, oh God, to each and every one of us. Equip all the fathers for the work of ministry, Lord. Help them, oh God, to rise up to a place where you want them to be. Even all the mothers, all the ladies here, my God, I just pray that they will stand, oh my God, with these fathers. Lord, and support them and pray for them. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.